Hello and welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Adriana Lazarescu and I'm your host for this episode. With me in the studio today is Dr. Dan Sadowski. Dan, last episode we began our discussion on prokinetic drugs and started with an overview of the enteric nervous system. What are we discussing today? Right, so today I'd like to demonstrate how various prokinetic drugs actually interact with the enteric nervous system to improve gut motility. It would be good to refer our listeners to the previous episode on the enteric nervous system. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And just by way of brief review, remember that the peristaltic reflex is the basis for all gut motility. Distension of the gut wall initiates a dual reflex arc that produces a contraction of smooth muscle behind the bolus, mediated by ACH, and relaxation ahead of the bolus, mediated by inhibitory neurotransmitters, such as VIP, nitric oxide, and ATP. You also mentioned that several important systems regulate this neuroreflex system in the gut. Why don't we start talking about the serotonin system first? So serotonin is released from the enterochromaffin cells in the gut in response to a variety of chemical and mechanical stimuli. And remember that serotonin has a number of receptors that it can bind to. For example, when it binds to the 5-HT4 receptor, it greatly enhances ACH release from the cholinergic nerves, thereby increasing smooth muscle contraction. Conversely, when serotonin binds to the 5-HT3 receptor, it works more on the relaxation side of the reflex arc. So is it possible to influence the gut serotonin system pharmacologically? Yes, it is. For example, let's take a look at the drug procalopride. Procalopride is a molecule that is a 5-HT4 receptor agonist. In human studies, it has been shown to speed up colonic transit time and has been approved for use in Canada for the treatment of idiopathic chronic constipation. Its usual dose is 2 milligrams once daily. And procalopride is the only drug that we currently have available that is a pure 5-HT4 receptor agonist. There used to be a drug called cisapride. How did that work? So cisapride as well uh, did work on the 5-HT4 receptor and was available for many years and was used to treat diabetic gastroparesis and slow transit constipation. However, it has been taken off the market because of cardiac arrhythmias. So are there any drugs that work on the 5-HT3 system? So when serotonin binds to the 5-HT3 receptor, several things happen. Gut relaxation occurs, resulting in increased forward flow. There is increased secretion of water in the gut, and there is increased visceral pain signal sensation to the CNS. So in gut motility disorders, like diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome, you can see why blocking the 5-HT3 receptor might be a good thing. What are some examples of 5-HT3 antagonists? So currently, we have alocitron and ondansetron. Let's talk about alocitron. So this drug is an example of a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. It reduces gut contractility, particularly in the colon, and also stimulates fluid absorption. And because of this, it's useful in the treatment of diarrhea-predominant irritable bowel syndrome. Alocitron, however, is not available in Canada. And in the U.S., it was found to be associated with the development of ischemic colitis in some patients, and thus is only available under a special access program. What about ondansetron? So ondansetron, as many of our listeners know, is a good drug for nausea and vomiting, particularly for vomiting occurring in the setting of chemotherapy. It turns out that chemotherapeutic drugs, especially cisplatin, cause a large release of serotonin from the gut. This serotonin can go to the brain and interact with the 5-HT3 receptor in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, thus resulting in vomiting. Ondansetron has a high affinity for these 5-HT3 receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone and thus block the vomiting response. There are several other drugs commonly used in GI, such as domperidone and metoclopramide. How do they work? Both of these drugs work on the dopaminergic system in the gut. 
dopamine is released in the gut by sympathetic nerves. Dopamine binds mainly to the D2 receptor and it acts as a break on the entire peristaltic reflex, decreasing ACH secretion as well as decreasing nitric oxide, VIP, and ATP release. Is it possible to influence the dopamine system with medication? Yes, so domperidone, for example, is a D2 receptor antagonist. It stimulates gut motility mainly in the upper GI tract and it has virtually no colonic activity. It does result in increased LES tone. It increases antral and small intestinal contractions. It is used mainly in patients who have symptoms of delayed gastric emptying and dyspepsia. And the usual dose is 10 milligrams taken 30 minutes before meals. What about metoclopramide? So metoclopramide has been around a lot longer than domperidone, and it essentially has the same effects mainly upper gut activity. However, it's not as clean a drug as domperidone. While it is a D2 receptor antagonist, it also binds to several other receptors. For example, it is actually a weak 5-HT4 agonist. Like domperidone, it is mainly used in patients who have symptoms arising from delayed gastric emptying. And again, the usual do dose is 10 milligrams 30 minutes before meals. Metoclopramide also has some ability to bind to the D2 receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, making it useful as an anti-emetic agent. As well, there is a parenteral preparation, which is available for intravenous or intramuscular administration. Perhaps you should mention some of the key safety issues with metoclopramide and domperidone. Right. So while safety issues with these drugs are rare, it is important that the prescriber be aware of the important adverse events. For example, metoclopramide does have some ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and can cause extrapyramidal effects such as acute dystonia, usually in the setting of intravenous administration. It can also cause Parkinsonian-like symptoms that may occur several weeks after initiation of therapy. These side effects usually reverse upon discontinuation of the medication. Metoclopramide, as well, can cause galactorrhea in women by blocking the inhibitory effect of dopamine on prolactin release. With domperidone, there is a slightly increased risk of ventricular arrhythmias, particularly in the setting of prolonged QT interval. The risk is especially elevated in individuals who are greater than 60 years of age and at doses above 30 milligrams per day. Like metoclopramide, Domperidone can also elevate serum prolactin levels, which can lead to galactorrhea, gynecomastia, amenorrhea, and impotence. And again, I should point out that these side effects are rare, and that these drugs can be an effective treatment for patients with upper GI motility disorders. Thanks, Dan. That's the end of our podcast. Today you discussed how we can influence the serotonin and dopamine systems with medications to enhance gut motility. Perhaps in our next episode, we can talk about the endogenous opioid system. Okay, let's do that. See you next time. Bye. Bye.